Today in the PLC Professor's Workshop, we're going to use some of this hardware to demonstrate a lab project working with remote I.O. Remote I.O. means that you have a network connection that leaves your chassis, your main local chassis, and by serial cable goes someplace else to another chassis or another group of I.O. And that other group of I.O. has to have an adapter that is a basically a matching network connection and it then marshals the data for the IO modules at that remote lo location. So let's discuss this lab project. Welcome to the next lab discussion video in support of an introduction to RS5000 volume 1 part of the PAC learn series. There were actually a couple different sections in here. One was adding communications modules to the passive backplane for the L40 series, 1768. There was also adding remote I.O., working with remote I.O. Continuing on with changing the processor type, we added some I.O. modules. We actually deleted the I.O. modules that we had with the L35E and, of course, the module-defined tags didn't disappear. The, the class of objects that you see over here on the left. And then we added in the actual I.O. modules with a slightly different part number for the DC and for the analog. And then the next step, and by the way, we did go through and kind of re-alias some of the tags just to show you how to do it. But remember that there were a number of tags that didn't get edited, that, that we didn't edit the tags to re-alias them to the new I.O. addresses. And we're not going to do that. That's not part of this lab. So I'll just leave that one up that was finished. And I'll scroll back down here so we can see our module defined tags and our I.O. configuration. So the next thing that we do is we add some communication modules to the 1768 backplane. And the 1768 backplane which is right here, 1768 bus over on your left. The 69, this is an active backplane. This is a passive backplane. So this backplane is well described in the lectures series for the complete PLC Learn series. If you have the lecture disc or if you are watching them on YouTube. And by the way, we primarily put them on YouTube for everyone to have access. Many people still buy the disc we assume so they can have a hard copy so it's more convenient. There is lectures on there that cover the active backplane, like the 1769 bus. Now, the 1769 bus with some of these newer modules is an improved active backplane, but it's still active nonetheless. And then the 1768 bus is a passive backplane. Those are strange words maybe, but if you watch those lectures in the lecture series, on you know active backplanes you'll understand basically a passive backplane no one really controls anyone the processor basically informs the modules on the passive backplane what their configuration is and then each of the modules on a passive backplane has its own microprocessor its own firmware its own ram and it behaves as a unique entity data wise and there's even some 1756 modules that you can actually put logic in. But that's a story for another another day, another lab project. We're not we're not doing that today. Nonetheless, 1768 backplane, so we want to add some communication modules. The first one we want to add, of course, is Ethernet. You never want to be without Ethernet. So I'm going to right click, new module, and you can see the only modules that are available to put on the 1768 backplane are what kind. If you look down through there, control net, control net, ethernet, ethernet, circos, or generic 1768. Now of course generic, I would, wouldn't even consider that as a module. I'm sure that there's some out there sold by, well, I'm drawing a blank on the name of some of the companies, but there's one company out there that makes quite a few aftermarket modules for all of the Allen Bradley processor platforms. 
ProSoft. That's who I was trying to think of, ProSoft. If you go there and look at their ProSoft's website, and you'll recognize the modules by their bulletin number. So there's 1771. I don't think they have any for that older, real old stuff. And then 1747, 1768, which you're looking at right here. Probably 1761, maybe. But anyway, so we're going to pick the ENBT. The eWeb is like an EMBT, except it has reduced functionality in one area, but increased in another. It is actually enhanced for creating a web page to put on the module. Most of these modules have web pages in, this, in a sense. In other words, you can go there by typing in the Ethernet address, and it will open the web page for that module. And you can see whatever you want to know about that module right on that web page. Maybe we'll do that if we get a chance. But ENBT, double click. The major rev level. You know, I don't know what we have, but we'll just see if that, we'll just say four and assume that we have the best. Okay, so I'm going to call this my ENBT. And we could go to RS links and check. And I'm going to give it an address of 192.168.1.98. I realize that I don't remember what is used and unused in our Ethernet scheme, so I'll just put that in. If we have to change it later, we change it later. Now, in the lab, I had you put in, I think, 99, but I think I already have 99 assigned to something else, either with the L35E or with my the NIC on my laptop. It has to be in the same sub-network. Our sub-network is 192.168.1. And then our network would be the last octet. You know, 0 through 255. And of course, you don't use 0, and you shouldn't use 255. So anywhere in between there. And I'm going to disable the keying to take the rev level right out of the mix. Click OK. Now you see we have an EMBT and of course Ethernet because the EMBT is plugged into the back plane and then coming off the front or bottom of the Ethernet card is a RJ45 to plug in an Ethernet cable. Now just for grins I think we'll go to RS links. We'll open up RS links. First I'm going to show you I have two drivers here. This is the DF1 RS232 driver and this is the Ethernet driver. This is the one we've been using. So I'm going to expand this. And there you see the back plane. Uh, now remember, this is this is the L45. Okay. RS-232 can't be plugged into both the L45 and the L35E simultaneously. That would take some adapters and defeat the purpose. And then I can expand this out. There's our Ethernet card. And of course, there's nothing plugged into it. It sees itself. So see MBT, MBT. So this is a graphic placeholder to show what is on that Ethernet. But this is a graphic placeholder, not an actuality. This is the actuality right here, right above it. This is the MBT. That's not. Okay, then we can expand. Now this is a module that we haven't added yet. But in RS Networks, you can see them. Okay, this is a placeholder for that MO4SC. If I were to turn on the drive that's connected to that Circos module through the Circos fiber optic network, it would probably show up. Okay, I, I just went and plugged in the drive. When I say plugged in the drive, what I mean is the fiber optic cable was already connected and the, all of the motor cables, encoder, all that were all connected on the drive, but I had the drive unplugged because of the noise it makes. And I don't know if you can hear the noise in the background, but the fan on the Ultra 3000 drive makes enough noise that it is probably showing up in the recording. I just plugged it in long enough for you to see that now there's a plus sign on the Circo interface. Before, we had MO4SE, and then it dropped down and showed Circos, but it did not show a plus sign. If we expand that, and again, of course, it shows a graphic placeholder that the MO4SE is on the Circos network, which it is right here. That's the actuality. That's a graphic placeholder. Then here's our Ultra 
3000, 230 volt AC circles, drive 10 amp, 30 amp, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, <laughs> um, get that to show up again. Yeah, 2KW. So it's not the smallest Ultra 3000. It's just one that I bought online used along with an MPO motor and a few other, oh, a linear actuator and some other things just so I could create motion labs. So I'm going to pause and unplug the drive to get rid of that noise. And of course, this is typical of RS Links. If RS Links through RS Who sees something and has an EDS file to support it, it brings up the image. But it remembers what was there. It doesn't forget unless you remove it. So I could right click on this and remove it and it would basically stay gone. But we'll leave it there. It's a pleasant memory. But it's gone. The noise is gone from the fan and the drive is gone as well. But I just wanted to sh take you a quick trip through this driver, the, the DF1 driver again. Now, here's what we want to do using this driver. I'm going to go into the ENBT that we added. Now remember, it doesn't have to be added in the project to show up in RS Links. And I want to go to Module Configuration, Port Configuration, and I want to change uh, this to 192, 168, 1 dot, I think I used 98, okay? And we can tighten up the subnet mask, it really doesn't matter. But since I basically told you this was the subnet mask we had, we'll stick to that. Okay, I'm going to hit apply, and okay. Now, if I've done this all correct, now remember, you could see everything here, okay? This is expanded all the way out. Remember, we also have the compact bus. So this is all also part of the L45. So we can, you know, go right on down to our digital modules. This is an RS Links. This in mind. RS Who is a little app that you can open in RS Links that browses a driver. It goes out there and whatever it finds, if it has an EDS file that has been registered in RS Links for this particular identification. You say identification, what does that mean? Right click, device properties. That's the identification right there, the ID. You can retrieve this information with a message instruction. You can do a message read instruction in logic that goes and reads the identification from anything, anywhere within the, the electronic reach of the processor. But here's the idea right here. Device name is not available, but it's vendor AB. Product type 7, which would probably be discrete IO. Product code 67. Uh, we'll say that vendor AB, since they basically created Ethernet IP device net control net and then gave it over to ODVA, they're probably vendor number 1. This actual information probably is vendor 1 product 7 code 67 revision 3.001 and it even has an EDS file name so you could take this file name go search on the internet and probably find it. Now, I don't know what the 3XX is. I don't know what the two X's are but that is the ID. In RS links you can go pretty much look at everyone. Keep in mind that's the EMBT that's not. This is the circles card that's not. So if you right click on one of these and go device properties Unable to establish communication with a selected device. Probable causes. I'm not going to read down through them all, but that's because that isn't there. It's here. This is just a graphic placeholder to remind you from the Circos interface standpoint, these are the two items that are on Circos right now. Now, these two are connected with a fiber optic ring. In other words, two fiber optic cables that go from this device to this device. But we could add another drive in there because this is an MO4 SE, it'll support four drives. So we could take and run a fiber optic cable from this card to this drive, to another drive, to another drive, to another drive, another drive, and then back to this card and have a fiber optic ring with five devices on it. That's what it supports. So we're going to collapse this down to make some room. And then we're going to go to 
Ethernet. And on Ethernet, we have my computer, 100. And then we have this Ethernet uh, to the L35E. So I can drill down. See, I'm coming in through Ethernet, not through RS-232. To the back plane, there's the uh, process. See, it's still got the program in it, or it still has the processor name conveyors, even though we may have another project name in there. It still remembers that it, the last time it was told who it was, its name was conveyors. And then, of course, uh, there is no place to go outside of DF1, but it does show you that the compact logic processor sees channel zero. These are both the same item. This is the actual and this is just a graphic placeholder. I know you're probably getting tired of hearing that. Now we'll go with the local bus adapter. And this is what we have on that L35E. Now remember the L35E is not what we're working with right now. I'll just spread this out a little bit so you can see more. Wow, that's a long-winded, <laughs> my goodness. I'd hate to carry around a name like that. That's what made the output card a P, Electronic Short Circuit Protection, P for protection. So remember that was an OB16P. Let's collapse, yeah, let's collapse that just to get some more space because I have limited vertical space on the screen here. Now I'm gonna plug in the ethernet cable to the L45 ENBT that we just added. And we'll see if it's friendly today. If it is, and of course, you know, I don't have that address in my Ethernet driver. I'm going to click up here because you can't edit a driver if it's browsing it. So we'll go to Workstation so it's not browsing. We'll go to Configure Drivers. We'll go to our Ethernet. Yeah, I don't have it in there. Remember, I told you I probably used 99. Well, I lied. <laughs> so we could have used 99 just like you did in the lab. So we'll just type in 192.168.1.98. And just for grins, we could punch in 99, 97, or we could even use the IP driver. Uh, I prefer using the Ethernet devices driver for this situation. So apply, OK, close. Now we'll go down and click on that. Oh, there we go, popped right in. Uh, we'll collapse this down as well. I'm gonna leave this much in here to show you the difference, OK? This Ethernet adapter that's part of the L35 is built right into the processor module and has the port right on the face of the module. It is plugged into the back plane for the Compact Logic system. However, the ENBT is plugged into the back plane of the 1768 bus. You have to go across the back plane to get to the processor or to get to the MO4SE. We'll expand out, and there's our I.O. modules. Then, of course, on the Circos interface, we had the MO4S scene. If I had left the drive plugged in, we could see the drive. I have Ethernet plugged into both the L35E and the L45. So there's the, see, it doesn't say L45 because that EMBT is not part of the L45. It's a separate module on the 1768 backplane. It's a separate entity. Whereas this is not a separate entity. You could say electronically or data-wise it is, but physically it's part of that processor right there. Even though it shows the backplane as the connection between the card and the processor, this is all one piece of plastic, so to speak. This is a piece of plastic this is a piece of plastic, and this is a piece of plastic. With all of these products, the back plane is not a separate chassis that you slide these components into. The back plane is made up of back plane segments. Each module has a segment of the back plane as part of its construction. 
And when you assemble these modules together, like the 1769 modules, they slide in. They slide into next to an adjoining module, and then there's a little lever on the on the top and towards the back that you rotate counterclockwise, and that engages a connector into the socket of the adjacent module to the left. With 1768, it engages into the module to the right. If you want to say 1768 is right wing, I'm sorry, left wing, and 1769 is right wing, and of course that depends on whether it's you or the processor, whether it's right or left. If you look at the processor, 1768 is to the left and 69 is to the right. But if you are the processor, then the 1768 is on your right and the 1769 is on your left. That was an interesting little side trip for you. And now we are connected. If we were to download this, of course, you know, we didn't finish editing tags. And we're not going to. We have extended now our paths onto the 1768 backplane to include a Circos network. So even though you might say that an MO4SE is a motion module, it's really not. It is a Circos communication adapter or bridge. Actually, it's not a bridge. It's just a communication adapter or Circos interface module. Okay, so we added that. The next thing that we're going to do, and since we're at 23 minutes, I think we'll uh, cap this off and then start another one to add... Uh, additional things into Ethernet. Now, some of this hardware that we're going to add in the next session, we don't actually have. We're just going to show you how to add it and configure it, but we won't be going online with it because we don't actually have that hardware at our disposal. Well, after all that, I decided to continue on with Remote I.O. Welcome back. In this section of the lab, extending your data world onto the highway, and into a remote neighborhood. Uh, we consider Ethernet as a data highway simply because there are no neighborhoods, only exits and interfaces in two neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods are actually data structures where data lives. But Ethernet, IP, device net, control net, they are all data highways. And they each have their specific characteristics and advantages and disadvantages. And we're not going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages in this presentation. We're just going to go through the lab. So the first thing we had you do was to add a 1794 AENT to your data network. And remember, you're adding this to Ethernet. Go over here to Ethernet, right-click, New Module. And, of course, we're going to get a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we're looking for communications devices, so we'll uncheck click on communications, uncheck, and just pick Alan Bradley. You can see the variety of bulletin numbers, 1715, 34, 38, 47, 56, 56, 57, 68, 69, 83, 88. That's the beauty of Ethernet is Ethernet is Ethernet. But these devices don't actually all have to be Ethernet IP. In this case, they do because we're going to do I.O. We're going to pick a 1794 AENT. We could have just typed in AENT and see we have quite a few AENTs. Uh, we're specifically looking for 1794. If we expand this out a little bit, then you can see the R has two ports. So if it has R, then there's two ports on there. In this case, we're just going to pick something simple that you're more likely to come across, a 1794 AENT. And we'll be real clever and call it my AENT. And we'll give it a fixed ID of 192.168.1.98. Now you're probably saying, whoa there. Mr. Gates, uh, you used 98 in the last lab. Well, I did because I thought 99 was already used, but then it turned out 99 was not used. So I went back and changed the ENBT to 99 so I could make this match the lab. So my apologies if that gave you a jump. Give it an IP address. 
And we could open up RS links. Let's bring this all the way up in here so you don't think you're missing anything. We could open up RS links in there. Go to RS who. Go to Ethernet. Here, see it's 99 now. If I go to Ethernet, I'm not going to find anything because I don't actually have anything plugged in. In other words, if we had 98, it would be right here. So I don't actually have this AENT, so I can't go look for the version number. But if I did actually have one plugged in and had an IP address set on it, and by the way, all of these Ethernet devices from, well, from almost all companies either have switches that you set to the IP. Most likely, though, they're going to have a interface that you go in to through your laptop or computer and you set it electronically or it has a little display on the front and you step through the parameters and set the IP or you use boot P boot P sees the Mac ID and when you see the Mac ID you say yeah that's it and here's the IP address I want that device to have and then boot P assigns that IP address to that device uh, there's many ways you can do it. In this case, we don't actually have the ANT, so it doesn't matter. So I'm going to close RS links. And I, if I go to change, really, there isn't much that I can actually change. 4.1 is, and I don't know what the minor is. We'll leave it 4.1. I'm going to disable Keen. Also, there's something called Rack Optimization and None. I'll just explain real quickly. Rack Optimization if you select that and we will we'll go ahead and select that it allows you to treat the Ethernet adapter and all of the modules on it as one data structure therefore you minimize the number of connections needed see it says rack connection when it says connection it's not talking about a cable or, or an electrical connection it's talking about an Ethernet communications connection and all of these processors that we're working with and the bridge cards, the Ethernet bridge cards, they are limited to a specific number of connections. So in many cases you have a budget for Ethernet connections and you want to not waste them by giving everybody out there a connection. Typically a 1756 chassis, each module can have its own connection or you can rack optimize and it treats the whole chassis as one data structure. So in this case we're just going to keep it simple. Chassis size, we'll just make it two. Uh, you pretty much have to specify this correctly for the number of modules that you want to put in there. Unfortunately, between one Ethernet adapter and another, sometimes the adapter is zero and the first module is one. Sometimes the adapter is one and the uh, first module is two. Most of them, I think, the first module is one. We'll just click OK, and then I'll drag this up so you can see. OK. OK. Close. And there's our AENT with a flex bus. So now our Ethernet card shows up, and this is the Ethernet cable, leaving the ENBT going to the AENT and then the adapter for Ethernet has a flex bus that uses flex IO and then to the flex bus we can add modules and so just for grins we'll add an input card we'll make it an IB16 and we'll say my remote and uh, this is DCN and it's in the very first slot. We'll just leave compatible keen and then we're going to add another card and we'll make this another digital card and we'll make it a output card. So we're looking for an OB16. See they have a diagnostic output. Uh, we'll go fancy with the diagnostic output. Go 
goes in slot one. Okay, so now we got an input card and an output card in the remote chassis. And I'm going to drag this over a little bit, close that window. And now you, now you see we have remote I.O. What separates this I.O., this uh, 1794 AENT and the two I.O. cards is the Ethernet cable. And there could be Ethernet switches, hubs, any other type of switching device in between the ENBT and this device. This device could be a couple hundred yards away. So that's how you configure I.O. Now we can go and look at the properties. And of course the RPI is set at 20 milliseconds. I think we pick rack optimize, if I remember correctly. I'm going to go back and look. If we pick rack optimized, then whatever RPI we set here is fixed for the whole bunch. So we'll change that to 40, just for grins. And of course, the OK is down at the bottom. And now we'll open that up again. See, now it says 40. So when you rack optimize, every module in that adapter bus on the flex bus is all going to have the RPI that you set for the AENT because you rack optimize. Now if you want individual connections, if you want to burn up your budget of connections, one per each module, you can do that and not select rack optimize module info and fault idle condition. So this is what makes this a diagnostic card. So you can set the safe state value at on or off. So in other words, if the system stops running, you can have a safe state value. If you had, say, a, a solenoid valve and you want that valve, that solenoid valve to stay energized as a safe state, if the processor stops, then that's what you do with these settings. Okay, that's a little beyond what we did in the lab. We'll maximize that back out. We'll drag this back over. So it looks like a real rung again. I don't care to look at this stuff all jammed up like that. I mean, if you got a really big rung that has, you know, 30, 40 instructions in it, it's going to be wrapped all over the place. Believe me, I've seen them. I try to avoid that myself. So, we added an AENT to our Ethernet. And then we also added a 1794IB16 and a 1794OB16, just like in your lab procedure. Then we spent some time showing uh, what kind of devices that you could have picked off of this AENT. So, besides the AENT, so if we go back to Ethernet, new module. If you look at the list here, we showed this list in the lab book so you could see the many many devices that you could pick to hang off of that Ethernet. And of course um, you can put quite a few. Okay, we'll close that. I think we'll just leave the lab finished at that so save your project remember that it was built with a compact logics with compact io 1769 and we will have gone through this procedure of adding io several different ways under several different conditions with control logics which we is probably next on the list to do something with control logics we've done it with l35 e and now l45 so you see the procedures basically the same you go to the bus you go to like the 1769 bus here. We want to add another module. We just right click and add another module. And then the process is the same. It comes up with a list. You can set the filters and then find your card. Now we're not going to add one because this is what we've got. Now we don't have this Ethernet stuff. To get rid of it, I'm going to right click, delete, right click, delete and then right click delete and now we're back to just the ENBT and the Ethernet cable that's it for this section and as I said we'll probably do control logic next thank you for watching this lab discussion video 
on adding communication modules and adding remote I.O.